Welcome back here on Live Now from Fox 835 on the East Coast and 535 on the West Coast. Do want to let you know that we are following some breaking news out of the Middle East this morning. The Israel Defense Force is now confirming the death of Yahya Sinwar's right-hand man. Rahi Mashtaha was the head of the Hamas government in the Gaza Strip and the IDF in a message not too long ago saying the quote de facto prime minister of the Gaza Strip died in Israeli airstrike. Now the strike itself was three months ago but his death again just being confirmed. Obviously, following that attack by Iran just days ago on Israel, there's a lot to discuss. So I do want to bring in Dr. Jonathan Shanzer, Senior Vice President for Research at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Thank you so much, as always, for taking the time to be here with us today. My pleasure. All right, so first off, I do want to briefly touch on the death here of Yahya Sinwar's right-hand man, as he's being referred to, the de facto prime minister. We are seeing the numbers really start to dwindle when you talk about Hamas and Hezbollah leadership overall. We are, and I got to say, uh, I'm not sure that this uh, individual, Mushtaha, is, is, is really anybody that uh, that. Uh, you know, that is important in the broad scheme of things. Uh, we're really scraping the bottom of the barrel now as it relates to Hamas leadership. There are really only a handful of recognizable names left. Uh, he was not particularly high on that list of those remaining. Uh, but, you know, this comes uh, as the Israelis report this morning that they've destroyed an eight kilometer long uh, underground tunnel. Uh, they've taken out something like 450 Hamas fighters. Uh, across the Gaza Strip over the last three months. This is in addition to, uh, I guess, more than 20,000 killed so far over the course of this war. Hamas does not look particularly strong right now. I think we are really watching the hard fighting in Gaza begin to wrap up for the Israelis. And I think from their perspective, that's probably a good thing because they are now faced with new fronts. They're obviously, they're fighting uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon. They've got ground operations happening there as we speak. And of course, there is the imminent response expected by the Israelis against Iran after that unprecedented assault the other night with 181 ballistic missiles. Want to talk more about that attack there. Again, 181 ballistic missiles. How do you think and when do you think Israel is going to respond? Because I guess the question that a lot of people have asked is, will the actual attack be larger than the one that Iran did launch on Israel on Tuesday? Well, you know, I think a couple of things. Number one, you know, it, it's the Jewish New Year right now. So Israelis are home with their families. They're eating you know, uh, family meals, they're spending some quality time together. I doubt that the Israeli government will want to launch something over the next day or two. Then after that comes the uh, the Jewish Sabbath on Friday. I think the Israelis will probably want to hold off on that too, just giving their people a break after a very traumatic evening the other night. Um, my guess is that it probably comes on Sunday or Monday. If it comes on Monday, uh, it would be actually rather poetic. This is, of course, 10 7. This would be the anniversary of that Hamas attack. There would be some meaning, I think, if the Israelis tried to launch something on that date. But I think a lot of this also really does depend on coordination with the United States. We are seeing messages coming out of the White House that the Biden administration wants to take part in some way in Israel's response. You got to remember the, the, the United States, the Biden administration warned Iran not to do this. Iran, of course, snubbed the United States, did it anyway. And so now I think the uh, the Biden administration needs to show the rest of the region, not just Israel, but you got to remember, we've got a bunch of other allies across the region, whether it's the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis, the Egyptians, the Jordanians. We've got to show them that we're reinforcing the U.S.-led regional order. And if we don't do that, I think we really begin to uh, lose their confidence, lose their faith. And that's, I think, something that the Biden administration is keen to do. They need to re uh, reestablish or reassure uh, these alliances. And so, yeah, I, I think the U.S. is probably going to be involved in some shape or form. And so when we talk about when that response comes, it's really not a question of if any longer. But if the, uh, uh, the U.S. does take part, 
we will, uh, you know, it, it could perhaps mean uh, something of a delay to make sure that the Israelis and the U.S. are on the same page before that strike is launched. This is going to be probably a difficult question to answer, so I figured I'd pose it to you because you are a true expert here. Is there any way to know who does have the stronger military overall, Israel or Iran? Now, we do know that the U.S. wants to take part in uh, whatever retaliation happens, so you almost have to factor them in. But speaking generally, Israel or Iran? You know, it's a tough question. What I what I would say, though, is that Israel probably comes out on top um, sort of pound for pound. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that there there are some specifics that you need to kind of dig into. Number one, I think the missile arsenal that Iran has, they build a lot of these missiles on the cheap. Uh, they've got greater numbers. The Israelis have um, better air defenses, although, of course, those are going to be limited if, uh, you know, if Israel sustains a lot of incoming fire, there's only going to be so many that the Israelis are going to be able to shoot down. So I think it, uh, Iran and its proxies possibly have some kind of an edge in terms of saturating Israeli airspace over the course of time. The Israelis have the edge in terms of air force. I mean, Iran doesn't have an air force to speak of. This is not a particularly advanced country in that realm. And I think that's how we're going to see the Israelis respond to the other night. Um, you know, you can expect those F-35s and, uh, and, and F-15s uh, taking to the air and uh, striking with incredible accuracy inside Iran. The Israelis back in April showed that they have the ability to evade those Russian-made air defense systems. It'll be interesting to see uh, how much they're able to penetrate those in a strike that Iran anticipates um, it is getting ready for. Um, but overall, I've got to say that uh, Iran has never actually uh, absorbed an attack along the lines of what we are about to see over perhaps the next couple of days or maybe weeks. Um, and so it's going to be a very interesting test for the regime. They have, I think, poked a hornet's nest here. Um, they've never, I mean, not in, in, not in many years, probably not since, I'm guessing, maybe the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s. That ended in 1988. Have they openly provoked an attack along the lines of what we are about to see? So it'll be very interesting to see how they prepare for this and whether they have a response when it's all said and done. I want to read a quote for you here. Uh, Jordan's foreign minister saying that Jordan will, quote, defend itself with all its capabilities if missiles and weapons are flying overhead. Is that overall a threat to both Iran and Israel to maybe not involve them in any way? Look, I think the Iranians are, uh, uh, you know, have continue to uh, destabilize Jordan. We know this, right? The Jordanians have been actually smuggling weapons and cash and fighters into uh, Jordan over the last, uh, I mean, really over the last year. We have, uh, we actually saw a Hezbollah rocket penetrate Jordanian airspace and fall into an open space uh, over the last week or so. Uh, the Jordanians have taken part in shooting down some of those Iranian missiles that were fired back in April, as well as the other night uh, during that unprecedented ballistic missile attack. So I think the Jordanians see very clearly that it's Jordan that is the aggressor here. But I do think that some of that messaging is certainly directed toward Israel, but not directly toward Israel. I think they're speaking to the population of Jordan. Uh, Jordan is, you know, I think if we're going to be realistic about it, it's probably 80 to 85, maybe even 90 percent Jordanian uh, or rather Palestinian origin uh, citizens. These are people that fled uh, the conflict between uh, Israel and its Arab neighbors, uh, fled Palestinian uh, areas uh, over the course of decades. And so now you've got a lot of Palestinians in Jordan. They don't like Israel. And the Jordanians often message to them. The rhetoric that we've seen out of Amman has been vitriolic toward Israel. Even though Israel didn't start this and is not uh, directly engaged militarily with the Jordanians, you gotta remember they still have a peace agreement, uh, but the government continues to message to its Palestinian citizens and I think that may be part of it. But look, Jordan is part of CENTCOM, right? They're part of a U.S.-led uh, regional 
uh, defense architecture. And I think they're very clear about that right now. They know that they need this in order to knock down some of these missiles and drones that are flying overhead. So I don't expect aggression toward Israel here, but the the messaging, I think they're 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 hedging and they're making sure that their people see this as, you know, perhaps more even handed, even if in reality it isn't. And what you're looking at right now is one of the live images that we do have over Lebanon. As we know, that ground operation is underway, again, limited in scope. But we did learn that eight Israeli soldiers were killed during the operations in southern Lebanon. So my question for you, are these operations maybe more dangerous than those that are happening in Gaza, or are they about the same in, in danger level? Well, look, I, I think the first thing you need to know is that Hezbollah is a lethal fighting force. Um, this is uh, a fighting force that's trained alongside the armies of Iran and Russia in Syria when Hezbollah was deployed there to fight on behalf of the Assad regime during the Syrian civil war. Um, they've got a lot of capabilities that I think Hamas doesn't have. They're better trained, they're better armed, uh, they're better funded. This is a, a more formidable fighting force without question. And I think from the Israeli perspective, look, there was no, there was no way that Israel wasn't gonna sustain um, deaths, injuries, I think that was a foregone conclusion. When you go in with a ground operation, you have to expect that um, the eight dead was was they were obviously a blow to the Israelis, especially after the month they just had, where they were really on the offensive. I think it's fair to say shellacking Hezbollah from the air. This is uh, perhaps a slowing of that momentum without question. I think the Israelis have to expect additional injuries, casualties as they continue to fight in southern Lebanon. This is the cost of war. Uh, but I would also just note that it's not all doom and gloom. The Israelis have shown this in their fight in Gaza over the last year. You got to remember there were some catastrophic moments for the IDF. Uh, early on in, in that war. And there have been actually uh, some subsequent moments like that uh, in, in, in the months that followed. But what happens is the Israelis begin to learn from what their enemy is able to do successfully. They've got really a very adaptable military. They learn on the fly how to protect themselves so that the tactic that worked just now that killed eight Israelis won't work again. They build systems um, and they've got defenses and, uh, and offensive systems as well that will prevent these kinds of casualties, I think, in the future. So they're learning from that. And, and by the way, you know, we see reports this morning that so far an estimated 60 Hezbollah fighters have been killed um, in the ground operations that we've seen starting on, I think it was October 1st. It might have been the day before that uh, in terms of what's been um, reported in the Israeli press. There may have been some special operators that got on the ground before the official ground limited ground operations uh, were underway. Uh, but I think right now the fighting still looks lopsided. And certainly with the airstrikes that are happening, even as we speak, uh, some senior Hezbollah leaders were reportedly taken out, as well as some Iranian advisors inside Lebanon. Hassan Nasrallah, the former or now dead uh, secretary general of Hezbollah, his son-in-law was reportedly killed in an Israeli airstrike this morning. They continue to really thin out the ranks of Hezbollah's leaders. So I think on balance, the Israelis still have the upper hand here, but yeah, they're going to be, I think, still catastrophic events that will be a gut punch to the Israeli public as they learn more about the toll that this war will take. All right, Dr. Jonathan Shanzer, thank you so much as always for taking the time to join us, a true expert. So we appreciate your insight into a lot of different questions, a lot of developments here. Anything else you want to add really about any of this before I let you go? You know, I'll, I'll just say this, that obviously we're anticipating a, uh, a major uh, Israeli response and, and, and maybe an American participation in that Israeli response to that unprecedented ballistic missile attack the other night launched by Iran. There are a lot of people talking about targets right now, and I think we can probably break those down into, you know, a couple of buckets. I mean, I think, you know, it, I think it's quite likely that the Israelis will tr will target the Iranian uh, uh, intelligence services because that appears to be what the Iranians tried to do, what the regime tried to do the other night. 
I would expect the Israelis to try to take out Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps facilities. The IRGC is the engine uh, financially, but also ideologically, the training, the arming of these groups that have surrounded Israel, Hezbollah, Hamas, uh, even the Houthis and others, you know, the IRGC plays a significant role. I expect those facilities to get hit, and there are a lot of those. So how Israeli, how, how the Israelis choose those targets will be interesting. From there, you know, I think there are some open questions. Do the Israelis target Iran's oil facilities? This would be a significant economic blow to the regime, and I think the Israelis are quite tempted to do that. They're thinking about taking out Iranian leaders which I think is unprecedented. The Israelis typically stay away from sovereign leaders. They have been obviously very open about targeting terrorist leaders in the past, but targeting the Iranian regime's leadership, that's an interesting new wrinkle here, and I'm watching for that. But I think the, the big question that everyone's asking right now is whether the Israelis want to target Iran's nuclear facilities. I think there is an, a, a, a real temptation on the part of the Israelis to do this. In other words, if you're going to attack Iran and not ta attack those nuclear sites that Israel's been worried about for years, that pose an existential threat at some point to the state of Israel, it would be a wasted opportunity. But of course, we're hearing right now from President Biden, he's warning against doing that. He's saying that this needs to be proportional, whatever that means after an unprecedented uh, ballistic missile attack of the size we saw the other night. So that I think those that's the array of targets, and we'll have to just wait and see what the Israelis choose from that menu. All right, Dr. Shanzer, thank you again for being here with us and breaking it all down as always. We appreciate it. Thank you.